Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. It's the Sunday that's out of Christmas. So we left the Christmas season behind liturgically this last week, and now we are in that first Sunday after Christmas, but it's called the second Sunday in ordinary time. Why? Well, how numbers work. So really, it's the second week in ordinary time, because this last week was the first week in ordinary time. And this is the Sunday of that week. So therefore, it is the second Sunday. And itself, ordinary time, all it refers to is a kind of number. So there are two kinds of numbers. There are ordinal numbers, and there are cardinal numbers. Cardinal numbers mean absolute values. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. You know, it's just like on Sesame Street. There are three. There are three things. Um, Okay, the Count was a great character, of course. Ordinal, however, means first, second, third, order. So ordinary time is actually just that. One comes after the other and they have that sequence. This being the second week in ordinary time, the Sunday of that week becomes the second Sunday, even though there was no first Sunday. So now that we got that out of the way. As always, it's snowing around here, again. <laughs> quite the snow year. If you look at the charts for snowpack, we're in actually one of the highest possible situations at the moment, which is interesting. Now, looking forward to the next several days, it looked like we were going to have a nice kind of quiet time and chill out, but then suddenly snow is back in the forecast. So we'll see how this goes. But everything is fine. Nothing is bad, as I like to say. So with all those things having been said, happy Sunday. Let's begin with our prayer. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may, by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good times. Let's dig in. The collect, by the way, for this is like one of the really exemplary collects. It's exactly what a collect is in like the most general and basic sense. So listen carefully. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who govern all things both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord said to me, you are my servant, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, the Lord says, for you to be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. I have waited, waited for the Lord, and he stooped toward me and heard my cry. And he put a new song into my mouth, a hymn to our God. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. 
sacrifice or offering you wished not, but ears open to obedience you gave me. Holocaust or sin offerings you sought not. Then said I, behold, I come. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. In the written scroll it is prescribed for me. To do your will, O oh my God, is my delight, and your law is within my heart. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. I announced your justice in the vast assembly. I did not restrain my lips as you, O oh Lord, know. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to you who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy, with all those everywhere who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. To those who accepted him, he gave power to become children of God. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further saying, I saw the spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, on whomever you see the spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the son of God. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One bit of news I forgot to mention. This morning, Brian, our friend, the seminarian in Rome, was made a lector. So that process of going toward ordination has taken a little something to think about. And unfortunately, I don't have any pictures to show you yet, just yet, but hopefully very, very soon. <clears throat> this is the last kind of bit of Christmas. I know that we've been saying that like Christmas as a season has ended, but the truth is that this is very much part of the epiphany mystery. That there's, there's no way to, to, to it, it is. <laughs> so much so that in fact, it's not Jesus who is showing something in this particular gospel, but rather John the Baptist who is doing his thing of pointing him out, behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is a beautiful image and very, very ancient and has a lot to go with indicating, of course, the lamb of sacrifice, which we get both with Abraham and the temple and everything in between. And there's a lot to say about that, to say nothing of like the Passover. And there's a lot going on there. But one of the interesting things about this particular gospel, of course, is that it's John saying so. It's like now he knows. When John is saying that, he's saying it in the voice of prophecy. That is to say, as the one who's kind of finishing up and completing the sequence of prophets who have been with Israel for a very, very long time. And this is why he says, I know now. <laughs> okay, very, very simply, that, that's that's really it. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if I wanna go on to this or that area about the Lamb of God. But what does this really have to do with the rest of things? Let's put a bigger context in this. So we've been through Advent, we've been through Christmas, and we're in this particular year of the lectionary, and we have yet to actually start in that stuff. So what are we actually looking forward to? Last year, we read primarily in Luke. 
Today, this gospel was from John, as it is kind of typical for kind of special days. John shows up a lot and other gospels kind of out of sequence for the sake of filling in these kind of special moments. But throughout the year and beginning next week, we're going to be hearing mostly in Matthew. And so in just a couple of weeks, we're also going to get like the Beatitudes. That'll be in two weeks, actually. But for now, we're kind of at this last stage of it. And in a way, it's very much for the sake of being able to present one last time. The Lord has appeared among us. And this testimony of John is not just one of pointing him out, but also of an invitation, as usual, to live our lives into the gospel. And we do that in a variety of ways, certainly whenever we point him out. The Lamb of God, the one who is sacrificed, the one who is the Savior, is a very big part of our lives, and we should live it that way, <laughs> which is kind of the message of Christmas in general. After all, there are several announcements that are made, whether that be from angels or shepherds or wise men and so on. And that thing of how this Christmas story has come to be has lots of demonstrations of Christ, even without him doing much. In a way, this gospel in John has about as many words of Jesus as the nativity does, which is to say none. Jesus doesn't speak in this particular gospel. Jesus has no words. He just is the Lamb of God. Behold. And it's John who speaks. So far in this sequence of gospels and this season that we've been in, it hasn't been the words of Jesus that we've been following, but rather that he exists and is the Son of God and is the Word and is the light and is the Lamb of God kind of putting together the last little bit for the configuration of all of these images of who he is. Then, finally, next week, we get the first of these Gospels in Matthew, which we'll be reading throughout this whole next year. And not trying to steal a thunder from that, but what are the first words of Jesus that we finally get to in this lectionary cycle? When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, says the gospel next week. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Nephtali. Oh yeah, Zebulun and Nephtali. We've been hearing a lot about them in Isaiah, right? Oh yeah, by the way, we still haven't quite finished. That what had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Nephtali and so on that we've already been listening to. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, and what did he say? Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel of the Lord is one that begins very much with this idea of repentance. Now, not so much, I, not, not, I don't want to focus on the idea of contrition, on the idea of we must be sorry for our sins. This is true. This is true generally. But rather, I want to focus on this idea that the constantly you know, we've been having this thing where people have been talking about Jesus. And I say the point of this is as a reminder to us to live our lives into the gospel. Very much is done also in this way. That is to say that the kind of humility of the heart, which is necessary for living our lives into the gospel, does begin with what Jesus says, sure, but also kind of a way of being, a manner, which understands humility especially. Humility comes to us primarily through our failings. Uh, we become humble because we are humbled, usually because we have erred. And from that humility, it's not just to stay there, to stay in that beginning of the proclamation of the gospel, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near, but rather again, to live our lives into it through its many ups and downs, through its fullness, which happens in a very big way when we show, like John the Baptist is doing in the gospel that we read today, the Lamb of God, to show him, to not just point him out, but to show him.
which then again sounds very much like that consistent message of the Christian, which is to allow our charity to be, to, to allow our lives to be lives that are actually of assistance. That's one of ways in which the lamb is shown. Also the other things too, the practice of our faith, the way in which we speak, the way in which we act, none of these things are particular actions. They're all in the category of ethos, or rather the way in which we see our lives kind of a philosophy as it were, or habit in a very basic kind of way to show him, to live that out. Now, as I say, we've been kind of in this period for a while of hearing about the Lord. And even when he does begin to preach, he doesn't begin immediately with kind of one of those big things. Like, like we're going to get to the Beatitudes in two weeks. The first part is repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand the idea of being in that mode of repentance, of, of being able to allow ourselves to be emptied of pride and of all of those things that perhaps we hold on to unnecessarily is the beginning, but it's also throughout our lives as Christians, which is why that conversion to Christ is one that is constantly happening and not just that one time if there was a one time. Rather, it's throughout. And so in this way, yes, we do do what I say, which is to live our lives into the gospel. I'm choosing these words rather carefully. To live into the gospel doesn't mean, of course, to simply reenact it, but rather to allow our lives to be shaped so profoundly. And this happens again through that process of humility, which ultimately is to know ourselves well, to know ourselves into the gospel, to live into the gospel, and all the rest of that. Anyway, <clears throat> when it comes down to it, this is also just very much the introduction to all the rest of these things. We hear about all these stories that are to come of the Lord and his, the many things that he has to say, and the way in which the gospel is presented to us, but not because we're trying to like emphasize that, like, yeah, God is good, which is true but rather that it's an opportunity to go into it, to allow it to form us really, really intrinsically, like right at the core of our being. And so living out this gospel life, again, it sounds like the coherent Christian life of actual charity, to living out this gospel life becomes the real invitation that we've had throughout Christmas even if we haven't really necessarily been thinking about that. We've probably been in, in the mode of our mind of thinking these are magnificent things that we are hearing about the Lord and the marvels around his birth and the angels and so on. But really it's been, and it continues to be an invitation to allow ourselves into the story, not simply as observers who are standing there and imagining all the rest of the, like the way in which it appears kind of better than a movie kind of version, but rather to allow it to change us. When we say, behold the Lamb of God, when we say that, usually liturgically, we also have at the same time the kind of the background of that as being the Lamb of God, who is also our communion. When we receive communion, which usually happens after this phrase, behold the Lamb of God, in fact, it's kind of the ritual phrase which introduces the, now we are going to go into the act of communion. It's also meant to represent the people who are receiving. There has to be an identity there. Otherwise, the, the, the idea of communion doesn't make any sense. He whom we receive is also who we are because we are becoming whom we receive. There has to be that connection. And so that Lamb of God whom we point out isn't just a third person kind of thing, but a first person. The Lamb of God is also very much an identity of who we are. And we do that through living into the gospel. <laughs> now, we have, of course, all the rest of the year, all the rest of our lives to think of this and to more and more configure ourselves to it. But 
in this fulcrum moment between the cycle of things that we have been thinking about with Christmas and these several weeks before Lent, we come to see how this gospel is lived in us as we live into it. Just a little introduction. As we always do, let's bring our prayers before the Lord that he will hear and answer us. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop Oscar, and for all bishops, that the childlike faith that God desires will always be in their hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the unborn, that whether planned or not, they will be welcomed into this world with love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the church, that she be welcoming and supportive to all, especially to those who feel they have no place to turn. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, that those with chronic illnesses will not lose hope for a cure. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Pope Benedict and for all the faithful departed, the choirs of angels may welcome them into the heavenly banquet. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for our diocese, as we continue with the Eucharistic revival, may we all be healed, converted, formed, and unified by an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering all our prayers into one, let us offer them in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. O God, from whom all good things come, Grant that we who call on you in our need may at your prompting discern what is right and by your guidance do it through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Great. It's still snowing. Let's keep praying. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy toward us. And after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down in mercy on your people who cry to you. And by the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of St. Joseph, her spouse, of your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, in mercy and goodness, hear our prayers for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother and Church. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Fantastic. Everyone have a lovely Sunday. Enjoy the snow <laughs> and all the rest. All right, God bless you all. And we'll see you again tomorrow on the holiday. All right, bye-bye.